keep going. Hello. Hello, everybody. Send a request. Let's talk. <laughs> Liberals don't debate. Uh, well, well, I'll try to keep it as respectful as I can with them. I also find conservatives to be difficult to debate as well. A lot of times conservatives resort to personal insult and straw man arguments, non sequiturs, um, personal attacks. And that's not, that's not the way to debate somebody. Libertarian. Oh, libertarian. Libertarians are, uh, what I call them are, uh, economic flat earthers, libertarians, uh, Interesting breed. I was uh, aware of libertarians at around 2004 when Ron Paul came on the scene, you know, ran for president. And I was really turned on by Ron Paul at first <clears throat> for his anti-war stance. Uh, it seemed like the Democrats and Republicans were really pro-war. And uh, it was both of these wars that we were in Iraq and Afghanistan were just totally absurd. So I appreciated Ron Paul's stance toward the war and, and just towards uh, the U S empire in general. But then um, I found out libertarians views on workers, which I was, and I am, and I was completely turned off and still am. Uh, libertarians are just uh, it's an absurd ideology and even more in a way um, idealistic, than conservatives, because at least conservatives understand that there is a certain amount of collectivization that people desire through their nationalism, which is not a good thing. Ron Paul is awesome. <clears throat> Ron Paul is not awesome, but I appreciate some of his stances. Um, and I think he, he means well in some ways, at least his stance on uh, imperialism and war in the U.S. empire. He just doesn't understand that capitalism requires, requires the state to, to be used as a tool of violence uh, on the people and internationally for the capitalist class to um, secure land for resources and cheap labor. The flu shot... <laughs> I've gotten the flu shot. I've gotten it. I, I don't really want to talk about, uh, like, the shot, you know. Uh, I go through these, these, um, these lives and everyone's talking about the, the vaccine. It's, I'm tired of that. I'd rather talk about more important things uh, than this fucking stupid thing every single live is talking about. So send a request and, and we can talk. If you're still on uh, Stone Dape, Stone Dape, tell me why you think Ron Paul is awesome.
Also, uh, Mr. or Ms. Stonedeep, I'd like to know also if you are a libertarian, are you also nationalistic at all? I find a lot of, a lot of libertarians are very nationalist as well, which is quite a con contradiction. Hello, John McIntosh. What do you want to talk about? Devon O, oh, hello.
So let's see who's there and just stoned ape, huh? Well, you still there, stoned ape? Hello. I am here to debate you guys, preferably liberals. Um, I could also debate a libertarian if, uh, if we can keep it cordial. Hello. Dahlia. How are you? He's doing the same thing. You would crush him. Strong black voice. He's doing the same thing. I would crush him. I hope I would crush him. I don't know. He's, he's debating liberals, though. I mean, I, I think I know who you're talking about, and he was debating some Trump supporter just now. And that's not, that's not really what I'm trying to do here, is debate these, uh, these guys. Um, these, these people are kind of lost to me. These Trump supporters are kind of lost. I'd rather talk to someone that has a little bit more knowledge and respect for humanity and some Trump supporter. Let me check him out though. Uh. Not too much. Not a whole lot. How's your day going? Uh, just working. I'm on, I'm off today. Taking care of some things. I want to talk politics. I don't like even calling it talking politics because talking politics. I go through all these these lives, and every fucking live is talking about the vaccine, talking about uh, identity politics, uh, class, you know, uh, culture war bullshit. And uh, it's like a fucking cesspool, these lives. So trying to do something a little different here. So when it comes to socialism, what sections of the economy are you talking about? Oh, uh, I'm talking about the entire economy. I mean, when they talk about, you know, a lot of Americans do not know what socialism is. A lot of the opponents of socialism have never read Marx, have never studied the revolutions from the perspective of the revolutionaries. And a lot of times when people think of socialism, they think of liberal reforms. They think of uh, the welfare state. They think of, you know, uh, reforms on capital, regulations on capital, 
And that's not really socialism. Uh, when I'm talking about socialism, I think of worker ownership <clears throat> of the means of production. I think of, at first, expropriation of industry, nationalizing and, and democratizing industry. Marx proposed it as just an idea, so I get what you mean, but I think it's okay in certain areas, but not in others. I mean, yeah, I think that there needs to be enough freedom for people who have ideas um, to bring those ideas to fruition. And I think that needs to be a part of the society. Um, Cuba is starting to do that um, under all the pressure that they're on. They are starting to let people start businesses there. Um, but these businesses need to be fair to workers and... What I think is um, if a business gets to a certain size, it needs to become democratized to go that direction instead of the direction that the owners, the shareholders, uh, are able to forever and ever just expropriate and uh, exploit their workers. Um, so, yeah. I do not believe in just uh, reform of capital. I believe in taking Facebook, taking Uber, taking Amazon, nationalizing them, democratizing them, and at some point, hopefully, giving it back to the workers because a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of these revolutions have gotten stuck in the period of nationalization and that is only supposed to be a small part of the process and not where it stays. We are anti-statists, not statists. The state is a instrument of violence that is used by the class in power, which under capitalism is the capitalist class. I agree with you 100%, but I wouldn't call your solution. That actually is socialism. A lot of us just... When I speak to people that don't, and I don't know if you know what it is, I don't know what you've read, I'm talking about in general. When I talk to people about what actual socialism is, they're like, that's not what I've been told. And I'm like, yeah, that's what we're actually arguing for. I, I've, you know, I've spent years reading the books, I've studied the revolutions from the point of the revolutionaries, and that's actually what we're trying to do here. You know, at the end of the day, power has to be in either the hands of one group or the other group. And under capitalism, the power is going to be in the hands of a small group of capitalists that are going to have all the money, all the wealth, all the power. They're going to have power over the state. And they're going to use that state power as a tool of violence over the working class. And you can't really have it another way. We've seen periods where the working class like took back some power and that was only temporary until the, the capitalist class was able to claw their way back. Would I agree that we are currently not capitalism? But no, I, I don't believe that. Uh, you know, I've seen libertarians use this term before, crony capitalism. And if you study the history of capitalism in the hundreds of years since capitalism started, we've been here before where we have a lot of power in monopolies and cartels. And this is just one stage of capitalism. What we call it is late stage capitalism, where everything is being commodified. Everything is under the power of the profit motive. <clears throat> You know, this is why we're seeing like charter schools. We're seeing things like libraries being private. Everything is being privatized. And the capitalist class has even more power than it had 30 to 40 years ago. Because the original republic, as it was supposed to be, had those systems. Not really. I mean, look, when I think of the American Revolution... The American Revolution, you know, we're taught about it in school as this, like, va ga valiant group of revolutionaries. And what they really were 
the founding fathers were a group of oligarchs who did not like paying their taxes, and they saw this monarchy as a block to them getting power and wealth. So they had this revolution. You know, at the time of the American Revolution, the monarchy was trying to limit the genocide they were committing against the Native Americans. They were trying to limit, put limits on slavery, and they were trying to limit their wealth and power in the colonies. So they said, we're going to have this revolution. We're not going to have to pay taxes. We're going to basically take, we're going to have an exchange from one group of, that has all power to another. And it kind of gives, uh, you know, it's, it's like, so they said, we're going to have this democracy, this re democratic republic. Only white men who own land are going to be able to participate in this democracy. And even then, we're going to have the electoral college that has the final say. And ultimately, we'll choose who is president of the United States, which from the beginning had way too much power, more power than they needed to compare to the legislature. Because the original Republic. Um, you know, I mean, look at the French Revolution, which only happened like 10 years later. It's such a different revolution than the American Revolution where they overthrew the monarchy and then there were two warring factions that fought for power for another 10 years. You had the working class against the oligarchy, the capitalist class, which were very similar to the American revolutionaries. So after they together threw, overthrew the monarchy, then they fought for another 10 years. We didn't have that. In the American Revolution, the oligarchy overthrew the monarchy and very firmly put their roots into power and have ruled over us ever since. So. It is interesting hearing you talk about history this way are not tied to who is in power now in any way, though. I mean, that's true, but they set up this system. They set up a system to give them way more power. That's why you see all the capitalist democracies that were formed after, and they're not like the United States. They don't give power... To, a, to an oligarchy, to a plutocracy like the United States. After the French Revolution, in, in Europe, there was this domino effect overthrowing monarchies and the people creating new systems. And that's why you see things like social democracy way more popular in Europe than you do here, because we were basically the first country to overthrow a monarchy. And the system that they set in place just gave way too much power to the wealthy and not just to the wealthy, because I want to make it very clear. Socialists, communists, um, do not oppose success. Uh, we oppose how people become wealthy. And if you become wealthy through exploitation of workers, that's what we oppose. So if you become a doctor, you become a lawyer, you become an athlete, something like that and become wealthy, through your own merits, through your own labor, that's awesome. But if you are a oligarch, if you are a member of the Walton family, if your wealth came from the work of others, that's what we oppose. I don't think we should stop speaking broadly. Let's break it down into monopolies were more in check until you were able to take over the whole market via the internet. But I think we should stop speaking broadly. Let's break it down into sections. Break it down into sections. Hello, Darren Johnson. What sections are you talking about that we are breaking down? Uh, what we Marxists have, we have certain principles that Marx uh, taught in his books, the, the Manifesto, Capital, and his other essays, called the base and the superstructure. And what the base is, is the, the economy of the society. 
and the superstructure is everything else that revolves around that economy, that political economy. So the base under capitalism is capitalism, and that will ultimately have control over everything else in that society. The culture, the education system, healthcare, everything. So that's why I, I prefer to talk about economics. I actually liked Bernie's idea of taxing. Yeah, I mean, look, I look at Bernie Sanders and I don't think anyone can say that Bernie didn't have good ideas. The thing that a lot of Americans don't understand about Bernie Sanders, though, and I think a mistake Bernie Sanders made was calling himself anything socialist. Um, Bernie Sanders promotes ideas that are commonplace in Europe and even parts of Sa South, uh, like South America. These policies are normal everywhere else. Um, and even less, re even like even the British Labour Party has more policies supporting things like worker cooperatives than Bernie Sanders. Like Bernie Sanders would be right in the center of the British Labour Party. Um, and if he called himself like a social democrat, I think that it would help a lot of people understand that things like like minor reforms on Wall Street are not socialism. Like, okay, they're good. Um, I think he raised class consciousness. He let people know, like, you're part of a class. You're part of, like, nationalism is such a huge problem in society. And this is one criticism I have of libertarians. I speak with libertarians, and some of their ideas I really like, and then I see that they're ultra-nationalist. And I'm like, you are a libertarian. Why are you ultra-nationalist? If you are an ultra-nationalist libertarian, you are a conservative. You're not a libertarian. As a libertarian, you should be like an ultra-individualist. And now you're part of this collectivist ideology of nationalism that has <clears throat> really like sucked so many well-meaning Americans into. And the right type of collectivist um, that's the right type of thing, and, and that's kind of what one of the good things Bernie did was let people know, like, you are part of something. You are part of the working class, and that's the type of thing you should understand. Like, we need to work together to improve our conditions, um, not some type of stupid fucking flag worship or, like... Uh, you know, uh, xenophobia, like we're better than everyone else. Um, that is just a distraction to divide us. That would be the only way I would back free education. Uh, the alternative to nationalism is globalism, is it not? No, I mean, look, I think that when we talk about globalism, we're talking about international capitalism, you know, multinational corporations. And I think it's such a contradiction when we talk about globalism. The people that are like, like these Alex Jones types, they're talking about the globalists. Okay, great. So let's look at globalism and global capital and the power that it has over the working class. Like, I want that to be a step towards finding an anti-capitalist message. Um, the, the alternative to nationalism is not globalism, but international worker solidarity and understanding that there are workers in every country that are fighting for workers to have more power in their society, more rights, more pay, safer conditions, and ultimately to have a society where the working class, us, have the, have the power in the society. Um, the opposite is intersectionalism, like intersectionalism. I think that like you have intersectionalism, you have social justice movements on the right. We have the culture wars. Um, I think that all that, and it's funny because I saw this thing on Fox News by, uh, what's his name? Not Hannity, the guy who used to wear bow ties. He, he talked about culture wars and identity politics as a distraction for all of us to be fighting against each other instead of understanding that we are part of different classes of people. 
And it was like, I, I almost felt like it was a, a moment of clarity that he had. What's his fucking name? He's the main guy. Um, so it's understand to under, it's important to understand intersectionalism that in a hierarchical system such as capitalism, that all these hierarchies are going to be formed by race, by gender, by sexual orientation. Everyone is put into Tucker Carlson. Yeah. Yeah, he's a total wolf in sheep's clothing. Intersectionalism is important to understand. Like we, in a capitalist system, we are all going to put in certain levels of the socioeconomic hierarchy and to have compassion and understanding for the people in those hierarchies. But ultimately, we should bring all those people that are fighting over their certain place in that hierarchy and bring them into class struggle and bring them into the common, you know, struggle that is class, but never deny their, their struggles as being, say, a woman, a woman of color, a woman of color that's also LGBTQ. Um, understand that in any capitalist system, these people are going to be oppressed, marginalized, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> My biggest problem with liberal ideas generally is there a set for a perfect world, which is sometimes unrealistic? Um, I think liberals want to have a certain type of society where, yeah, I think it is unrealistic. I think it is because liberals want to keep capitalism ultimately, but they want to have the groups that are marginalized and oppressed by capitalism have equal rights. And they think that with my, like under minor capitalist reforms, that those reforms are going to stay. And any reforms that are made under capitalism will be undone and will be undone pretty quickly. I mean, we look at the new deal reforms and a lot of them have been undone. <clears throat> so I don't believe in these minor reforms that liberals want to make. Um, I think we should fight for them, but understand that they're part of a bigger picture. Um, you don't just stop it at these minor reforms. It's like, it's like putting lipstick on a pig. I think, do you think affirmative action is a good solution to equality of opportunity? Um, wow. <clears throat> affirmative action. This is like this culture war stuff, affirmative action for whom it benefited women the most. And that is true. Affirmative action did benefit women the most. Um, I think that affirmative action and policies like that, and also Asians, it, you know, you go to Harvard now or you go to any Ivy League school, it's full of Asians. And those groups really, really took a lot of advantage of affirmative action policies where different groups that have experienced more generations of marginalization and oppression have not. Um, I think there should be some policies in place to assist marginalized groups, but there are better ways than affirmative action. I think that ultimately what we should have is an education system that across the board is equal and the education system in this country is not equal. Property uh, taxes determine what kind of the quality of school that these kids are going to go through K through 12. And if every student received the same quality of education, then we wouldn't need as much affirmative action policies. Because it's even shown that like straight A students in marginalized areas will go to a top school and really, really, really struggle. I have relatives that are about to pay taxes on each head of cattle and any untaxed income over it. Okay. Right-wing extremists are as much worse than liberals. Uh, I, I, I think that they ultimately are individualists and support private property. Trump to prison. Yeah, I mean, I don't think they are. I, I'm a former liberal. I'm actually a former conservative. I, I was a Republican until I was 22. 
and a liberal for years. I just didn't understand that those were not really solutions. Uh, I thought that they were. I thought we could have, you know, best of both worlds and both sides could compromise, but ultimately they cannot. GMOs? I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I try not to form solid opinions about something that I don't know enough about. <clears throat> I try to eat as much organic food and non-GMO food as I can. But for me to form a solid opinion about something like GMO, excuse me, I would need to do a lot of research and really find out the science of it for me to say I support it or I oppose it. Because I really don't know. I mean, GMOs are even like, you know, plants and foods that have been cross breeded to make a better plant. And that's a GMO. And breeding plants is, there's nothing wrong with it. People have been breeding plants for thousands of years. Corn, if you look at what corn was like 2,000 years ago, it's not the same as corn now. So it's, it, there's a lot of nuance when we come to GMOs. Thank you for asking. And thank you for the follow. <clears throat> yee yee boy. Yes, corn was very small. Yeah, corn was not edible. And I mean, some GMOs might be totally fine. I've heard thing, they've GMO things to make it healthier for us. So I don't, I don't really know. I really try not to form solid opinions about stuff. I am not a scientist. Uh, I am in the medical field, so I do have certain uh, positions on medical issues. Um, again, I'll repeat, I was talking about it in the beginning of my life. <clears throat> I don't want to talk about the fucking vaccine. I've gone, I, when I sway through lives, it's like vaccine, 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 vaccine. And that's not what I want to talk about. Liberals and conservatives uh, arguing over vaccines. Um, but I'm in the medical field, so I have a certain uh, understanding of, like, medical. You said you were a conservative and you were liberal. Just curious, what's your base? I'm a socialist now. I'm a socialist. Uh, I identify, you could, socialist, communist. Um, I'm a leftist. Uh, but I was a liberal uh, from until 22. I was a conservative. I grew up in a very conservative family, and... Up until around 2015, 2016, I was a liberal, but I was always very curious. I was always reading and always trying to find out the truth. I never really said, you know, was very firm in my ideas because I wasn't sure that my ideas were right. So, hey, good to meet you too. Um, so I am most firm in my ideas of, of building uh, socialism. Um, I just feel that that is a more realistic and permanent solution to building a better future for humanity and for the environment. I don't think conservatism or libertarianism or liberalism would is really going to bring us forward. Being around conservatives is what made me want to be a far, far... It's not easy. It's, it's not easy being around conservatives. Uh, I remember when I used to work construction in my early 20s, I was around a lot of conservative guys. That was my time around the most conservatives. Uh, I am mixed race. I'm half white and half Latino. And I was regularly called spick, um, black people, I shouldn't be using terms like that. Uh, I don't want to get reported. I was constantly called racial slurs. They usually uh, called anyone of any color racial slurs. Um, I really got to know conservatism a lot. Uh, and that's part of why I left it, because it just didn't feel right to me. And the economics of it. I was really, uh, I'll say again, I was really turned on to libertarianism as well. Um, around 2004. But then I found their, their views on workers, which I was, and I still am. I'm a worker. And those ideas, although uh, internationally and foreign policy, I, I agree with more in terms of 
rights for workers, uh, libertarianism is almost pretty much maybe worse than conservatism. Socialized medicine is our only option. I saw a stat, 600,000 bankrupt. Uh, it's ups- absolutely. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you, George Clooney. I appreciate that. Um, I think we should fight for socialized medicine. Absolutely. Um, you know, as much as I criticize, like, reform, I think that we should talk about reform for the working class, like, for now, because people are dying. People are going into bankruptcy. Um, but we should also put as much time and effort into raising class consciousness and educating people about socialism because we are so uneducated about what it actually is. And it's, it's really nothing for people to be afraid of if, if you are countries with socialized. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm a conservative. Is that okay that I don't hate? Yeah, totally. Totally. Military TikTok. Hey, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's important for us to stay open minded to other political views and respectful. That's why I said, like, let's have a respectful debate. Um, All I'm doing is swiping through lives. And it is so frustrating hearing the insults uh, just going back and forth. One guy said, oh, I'm for the vaccine, and the other guy was calling him a fucking idiot. And I don't think that's a way to move forward. Um, so I'm trying to have this live. Hey, yeah. Um, hey, conservatives. Uh, I'm a former conservative, but now I am a socialist. Um, and I know that's kind of scary and crazy. It's like sacrilege uh, to a lot of people living in the global center of capitalism. Uh, it is part of our DNA to fear and hate socialism and communism and the USSR and all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> I'm not here to tell you that the USSR was all great. I think most socialists would say that it was what we would call a failed experiment um, at socialism. What is funny about the USSR, I will say, is that... All these different policies that European countries had and still have, like child, free child care, socialized medicine, um, you know, they have, uh, you know, post, uh, post when you have birth, what is it, um, child care after birth. All these policies came out of the USSR, free college. A lot of the New Deal policies came out of the all these amazing things came out of the USSR and they came out of the USSR while we were saying the USSR is the evil empire all these things like some of the best things of our society started in the USSR um, and they, they 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 created these reforms to stop socialist movements within these countries so we say we're going to take these things out of the USSR these great things and we're going to crush these movements, these workers' movements. Um, yeah, I feel that military industrial complex and billionaires. I say it's just profit. Yeah, I mean, I am, I'll say I'm 39 years old. I was 19 when 9 11 happened. Um, and we quickly went off to war in Afghanistan. We went to war in Iraq. And that was the one, the Iraq war was truly what turned me into not being a conservative anymore. <clears throat> At 22 years old was, um, how old was, I think it was 2004, I was done with conservatism because it really, I held such an open mind during the two wars we went into and finally the Iraq war happened and it was all uncovered that it was just based on a big lie. And although many liberals, including Joe Biden, were really in support of the Iraq war, the conservatives were flatly, completely in support of this war that was fully based on lives. And thousands of people were dying. Um, Soldiers were dying. Military members were dying. And it was fully based on a lie. And I I couldn't be part of this ideology anymore. And then I learned the history of the military-industrial complex. Uh, President Eisenhower's outgoing speech of of the presidency talking about this growing military-industrial complex 
which is going to find ways to be in permanent war. And, you know, 50, 60 years later, that's what we're in now. We are impeach Biden. Uh, okay. Joe Biden isn't a liberal. He is. Joe Biden is a, a liberal. Um, he is. He like the quintessential liberal. Um, Joe Biden believes in in toothless reform of of Wall Street. Uh, Joe Biden has a history of of racism. Joe Biden supported and wrote the ninety four crime bill. Joe Biden is what is called a neoliberal politician. Neoliberalism is the economic strategy of both parties um, since the late seventies, early eighties, and um, you know, it's, it's free market politics, and that's pretty much what Joe Biden believes in. People were so mad about Biden bringing the military home, but the truth is neoliberal, yeah. No, I also believe that um, the, the, um, the exit of Afghanistan was botched. Um, I think that it was just so immediate. I think that the war needed to end. And I'm happy that he brought them home, but so sudden, it was kind of a shock. And at least, at least have it build over over several weeks or months, something like that. Um, not just like, boom, over a day. Um, I think it could have been handled differently. I also don't know how much say the generals had in uh, that uh, exit. Uh, I'm glad he brought us home because it was a pointless war. I mean, one interesting fact that I learned <clears throat> about the Afghanistan war was in the first weeks of the war, the Taliban offered to give up bin Laden. The Taliban did not want to be holding on to bin Laden. They offered to give up bin Laden um, in a neutral country that we would take him into custody. And the U.S. refused to take bin Laden. So we could keep on bombing and profiting off of the war. When I say we, the military industrial complex could continue profiting off of this war. Um, and that's really why the U.S. stayed in the war, to have a regime change and, and, to, and for the companies that were paying these politicians to make billions. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, let's do this. I don't know what you're up to. But sure. Sure. Hello. Hello. You froze. What war shouldn't have started at all? Uh, that's funny. Um, what war shouldn't have started at all? I, I think that none of the wars that the U.S. has gotten involved in since, uh, since World War II should have started. Uh, I don't think the Korean War, Vietnam, I don't think that uh, the Iraq-Afghanistan war should have happened. Not at all. They were all uh, imperialist wars for profit. Um, and, yeah, um, and I want to just be clear that, like, I do not support the military, but I understand why a lot of people, that's okay. I think a lot of people join the military because there's no other options. None at all. But when there are countries that want power, other countries aren't. Yeah. Where are you at in the BX? Um, I don't want to give, like, my exact location. But I'm in the North Bronx. I'm in the North Bronx. Why? Are you in the Bronx, uh, Nesh Neshmati? Okay, cool, cool. Hey, Bronx people. Yeah, um, like, and, and what I was talking about imperialism and, and, and the wars that the U.S. has been getting involved in. As the economy gets worse and as people have less and less options, <clears throat> more people will want to join the military. Cool. Very cool. North Bronx. Um, you know, when I when I speak with members of the military, they they say, "What were my options? You know, work in an in a Walmart, work in an Amazon center, or or join the military and create a career for myself and actually make a living where I could buy a house." I completely understand. Um, 
but sometimes you're going to risk your life and you're going to possibly kill others really for the profit of U.S. companies, whether they're oil companies or weapons companies or other companies that will, you know, that seek to extract resources from from poor countries. I'm always worried about starting. Yeah, of course. Of course I would be worried, you know. I, I, I don't want our children to go to war and I don't want our children to go to war for, for some stupid reason, you know? Uh, so, you know, like, let's talk about the 2019 coup in Bolivia that the U S supported because they, the Bolivian, the country, the, the government of Bolivia nationalized their lithium mines. Elon Musk said, we will coup whoever we want. And the U.S. supported that coup because Bolivia was kicking U.S. companies out of Bolivia. And uh, we could go to, you know, how many times has the U.S. invaded Latin America, overthrown governments, uh, you know, propped up dictators? A devout Muslim? Since you're a devout Muslim, what are you? I'm not, I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a Muslim. Uh, I'm not a Muslim. I... I I believe in the Palestinian cause. Um, <laughs> Elon Musk is my dad. He's, I don't think he'd be a great dad. He, Elon Musk seems really into himself. He seems like a really selfish guy. Um, Karl Marx is the best? I don't... See, I, I, I don't believe in great man theory. Uh, I, I've learned a lot from reading Marx. But... He is just one man that I've read, that I've learned from. <clears throat> He's really into his work. Conservatives immediately have conserved racially profiling him. America is a third world country, and I do not feel sorry for you. It, it really is a third world country. Um, you know, I live in New York City, and I say when I leave New York, I feel like I'm entering into America. There's a lot of poverty. There's a lot, a lot of... Uh, food insecurity in the United States. And these people who are living in practically a third world country now are so proud of being an American and so nationalistic. And, and what are they proud of? I mean, it's, it's, it's just getting worse and worse. Big city nerd. Yeah, I'm a nerd, I guess. You have a choice to get another job. Capitalism is inherently undemocratic, yeah. Uh, one of something that I did in my journey uh, towards being a communist in the 2010s, I started trading in the stock market and I did this for a few years and I found out how much democracy there is for capitalists. Um, and what I mean that is when you buy stock, so if you like trade in Robin Hood um, and you have one share of Facebook stock or you have a share in Uber stock or any, any of these stocks, you're brought into shareholder meetings where after the shareholder meetings, you're brought in to vote on who is the board of directors. And the board of directors vote on who is the CEO of the company. And the more shares of stock you have, the, the more votes you have. So the more wealth you have, the more say you have. So it's funny because there is democracy in capitalism, but it's not for the workers or for the working class. Democracy under capitalism is for those who own capital. And the more capital you own, the more power and say you have. Um, I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm not free. Okay. And if you're not doing shit about problems, stop focusing on the issues. Well, okay. I was born and raised in a communist country. Okay, I mean, communist country, it's, it's kind of, uh, communism is not a country, you know? Uh, I believe socialism is a country, Co communism, the real definition of communism is the absence of a state. Um, so what we believe is we would have socialism and socialism would grow um, and we would be able to knock down borders and and have more international solidarity and we would be able to have government and governance, but not the state as we see it. So you can't really have a communist country. This is just an SOB stream. This is okay. Socialism over communism. 
I mean, I, I believe that hopefully we would understand what communism is. Complaining about things you'll never attempt to fix. I am attempting. I mean, part of it is speaking to people. Um, part of it is uh, joining an organization. I, I believe that if you are a leftist, you should join an organization. Um, there is the DSA, there's the PSL, there's the IMT. If you want to do something, do something in your community. Uh, join an organization that uh, performs mutual aid, that organizes, that does political education, um, and help out your community and, and build this movement. Um, this is just one thing that I'm doing. Communism requires a moneyless society. Uh, no country has ever been communist. That's true. No country has ever been communist. You, it, co communism is the absence of a country. But what I think that the debate on, on what topics, let's just debate on politics. Let's debate on um, how we want to uh, <clears throat> improve our society. So, guys, send a guest request and I'll, I'll talk to whoever, whoever you want. Um, we should debate on how to build socialism, how to grow a socialist movement, and what that would actually mean in the United States. Um, socialism is a people's movement. Ultimately, we're not going to have socialism uh, if the people don't want it. It is a people-centered movement centered around the working class taking power. Name when socialism has worked. Um, what, what I can say about socialism working Socialism worked in the USSR. Socialism has worked in Cuba. Socialism has worked in Vietnam. Um, socialism has worked in Latin America. <clears throat> right now, Bolivia has cut illiteracy in half. They've cut poverty in half um, since building socialism in the last 15 years. And they did it through elections. They, Bolivia did not have a violent revolution. They elected socialist leaders that have been nationalizing their industries. They've been democratizing. They've been educating. They've decreased um, uh, food scarcity. They have, you know, and that movement was brought on by labor unions and by the working class and by peasants. Um, the problem that socialism has had is once these societies start to progress the United States leads the, the charge of sanctioning, embargoing, attacking. Um, so there was a coup in 2019 in Bolivia, and then the next year, the MAS party, the Socialist Party, won power back. Um, so we, we have to understand that socialism does uh, come into a lot of problems, um, but that is not problems brought on internally that is problems externally and mainly economic warfare. We do not want it and I'll fight to the death. I'm sorry, but our what we call our freedoms in the United States are what? Um, freedom is an illusion in the United States. Democracy is an illusion. Uh, you know, even the other capitalist countries in, in Europe have much more freedom and democracy than the United States. Um, and once any group tries to win some more power back, they have to keep on. It's not a democracy. It's a what we call a democratic republic. And these people that are meant to represent us do not represent us. These representatives represent, represent their corporate donors, Democrats and Republicans. Democrats and Republicans equally do not work for the people. Democrats and Republicans work for their corporate masters. <clears throat> One group, the Democrats, just speak more empty platitudes to marginalize and oppress groups than the Republicans who are way more honest at this time with their bigotry and their hate and their loyalty towards capital. Um, but that could change. Look, the parties flipped. But neither of them are workers' parties, neither of them are labor parties. Um, the first line of the Democratic Party platform equates socialism with fascism. So anyone that wants to call the Democrats socialists, just look at the opening 
line of the Democratic Party platform. It's um, the Democratic Party is ideologically to the right of the British Labour Party and even the British Conservative Party. The British Conservative Party Hello. Uh, how you doing? Hi, good. How are you? I'm good, good. So let um, me get my name straight. is Chris. I'm sorry, Chris. That was rude of me. My name is Marv. Nice Which, to meet you. Mark. Okay. Yeah. From Texas. I, I got hey. a question. Sure. So you were saying that for socialism, every time socialism is being tried, the United States goes out of their way to make sure it doesn't succeed, right? Correct. Okay. Why do you need capitalism? in order for socialism to be successful then? That's what Why I Why do you need understand. capitalism in order for socialism to be successful? Yes. Social, okay, well, socialism is an economic system that typically capitalism grows out of capitalism. But, you know, in the USSR, that's not what happened. What they tried to do in Russia was jump straight from feudalism into socialism. And it was a very rocky uh, transition and ultimately uh, they failed. Right. But capitalism is a system that divides people into classes. Um, and when I mean classes, you know, the big two classes are the working class and the capitalist class. Right. So but the you working can cl your class at any time. <clears throat> if you want to be a capitalist, yeah, you can go from a worker to a business owner at any point you want to. It's a freedom of choice. In socialism, you don't have that choice. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? No, with that? Well, you have. Well, I, I could understand that. And there are people that jump. But the way that people jump under capitalism, we have to understand is through liberal reforms, like regulation and <clears throat> an organized labor. No, that that's not capitalism. True. I, I can, hold on, listen, hold on, because capitalism, because capitalism left to its own devices. Let's see, when was capitalism really pure capitalism in the United States? At what time? Well, without any without any social. reform or regulation it, it never has been you have to have guidelines in order for it to work just like socialism i mean you don't have pure <clears throat> unadulterated socialism anywhere in the world well what is pure unadulterated socialism socialism is a transition but, process but when the closest that but, we okay. got to pure unadul unadulterated what? capitalism was when pre-1865 when we had the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade, and we had things like company towns, and there was little to no regulation, and the state really functioned as a means to serve capitalism, nothing but. Not true. And there was very, the there was very little social mobility. So the more social mobility, we could see that societies, capitalist societies with the most social mobility, have the most regulation and organized labor in order to assist social mobility. And what we're seeing now as regulation and organized labor weakens, we're seeing less and less social mobility. So I, I agree that I would love to have like a, a society, like I think Europe has found a compromise and I think that's cool. Like they're, the social democracies have a lot of social mobility, but that's due to their regulation and the fact that their revolutions occurred after the United States and they learned from the mistakes of the United States. Okay, but Europe is not a socialist country they have no, a lot of their social, social democracies programs, but they yeah. have a lot of programs that's that's really but they they pay for those as well uh i mean you know what <clears> we make <throat> what we pay on our social uh programs is different from what they pay in their social programs so i mean yeah it's, it's apples to oranges i mean it's totally different uh mm -hmm. in how they, they also run don't operate on a fiat currency which is a lot different than how the united states operates so their, their monetary policy is a lot different than U.S. monetary policy. They pay, we don't. <clears throat> no, we, we, we pay to an extent. Well, I mean, since, since, I mean, well, well, since 1971, when the U.S. went off the gold standard and started using a fiat currency, our federal taxes um, do not go towards federal spending anymore. So where do they go? <clears throat> Federal taxes get deleted and all federal spending is new money. So that's why the US runs deficits every year and those but, deficits do not affect the way 
uh, nations that do not run on a fiat currency are like countries that are on the euro. The euro well, is not a fiat currency. It, it, it's a lot of that other problem, too. I mean, we're talking about, like, China right now, China's defaulting on a lot of their, uh, well, their, their markets are starting to fault on their payments. And mm -hmm. it's it's been said that even China has eight billion or eight trillion, I think it is, uh, in loans that they they don't publicize, that they don't even acknowledge, uh, that they're mm -hmm. hiding. Um, mm -hmm. So China is is you know a, a sock puppet in, in in a lot of aspects. But um, getting back to the socialists and the uh, and yeah and, yeah yeah, tell me about it. So, yeah, so have you read is, Marx? Have you read no. Marx? Have you read Lenin? No, um, no I'm have you read Trotsky? No. Nope. So I'm you're not. basing your opinions on a lot of kind of what I, I I'm a former conservative. So you're I, basing a lot of your opinions on what I used to think and what we've been told. No, no, no. I base mine on my experience. Listen, I, I, I've lived in Germany for eight years. I've lived in South America for four years. I've actually had firsthand. I've seen a country go from uh, a, a, a republic to a socialism uh, to a dictatorship, and then back to a uh, republic again. I've actually been in that program, been in, in, in that country while it happened, and that was when Noriega okay. was in Panama. Okay, he took over the country. We uh, liberated the country, and now twenty years, forty years, thirty years later, Panama is thriving. And you know what's funny about Panama? Do you know how Panama was formed? <clears throat> Panama was an indigenous country. I mean, there was a lot of Indians that were living there. Yeah, the, but so the, Panama the is Panama is a victim of directly of U.S. imperialism. So the U.S. wanted to build the Panama Canal. I believe that was in 1908, and right. it was not part of Panama; it was part of Colombia. So right, what the, the United answer. States did was it funded and trained rebels within Colombia to create a civil war and secede from Colombia. And the US, it was a U.S. and France joint venture in order to create the nation of Panama, was com which was completely under U.S. and French control. And that's really what the U.S. since 1865 has done oh, um, throughout uh, Latin stuff, America. <clears throat> but but I'm going to I'm going to stop you right there. I, I know that France originally started digging the canal and they were not technically advanced enough to continue digging the canal. And therefore, the United States was invited in. And they had a specific doctor that uh, that was uh, familiar with the uh, malaria right. problem that they were having down there. And therefore, <clears throat> as part of the agreement, we went in there and we took mm -hmm. over and finished out the canal <clears throat> from there. Yeah. Prior mm -hmm. to that, I don't believe we had much intervention with them at all. Now I'm We not, created I'm not, that country. And, and that's basically right now. a... And right, now, and right now, China has stepped in. Listen, no matter where you go, there's going to be an influence from a big brother. I mean, whether it's mm -hmm. China, Russia, or United States. So my question is this. Yeah. China is starving its people. China is starving its people. Uh, North Korea is starving its people. Okay? Um, and, and their goal is domination. Just like a lot of other countries. And I'm not saying that America is great. It's better than a lot of the other countries. Now, who mm -hmm. would you rather have in charge? Would you rather have uh, China in charge? Would you rather have uh, Russia in charge? Or would you rather mm -hmm. have the United States in charge? Okay, I'll, I'll answer your question. First of all, um, the data and the statistics of China uh, dis disputes your claim that they're starving their people. Food insecurity in the That's last 40 from. years. Food insecurity in China has been decreasing. China has a 90% um, home ownership rate. Um, so the, I, I'm not a fan of the, I don't know if you've heard of the term dialectical materialism. Yes. But basically you have, okay. So you wouldn't, I wouldn't be a dialectical materialist if I wanted the Chinese system put onto the United States or the Russian system place on the United States. Influence, uh, influence, so influence. yeah, so, but the fact is, is that what China is doing is a lot different than what the United States has done internationally. Right. So right. what the US has done, let's take Latin America. If there's a government in Latin America, <clears throat> including 
two countries where my family has come from, if they elect a leader that is not friendly to U.S. companies that completely own all the land, they oh, will assassinate, they will overthrow that yep. leader, and the United yep. States will install a usually fascist puppet dictator like Pinochet in 1973. That is correct. Who killed like 10,000 people. I don't know if you're aware of Operation Condor in Latin America, but there I were am. like dozens of assassin 60,000 people died in, from 1970 to 1979 through Operation Condor. Um, so what China's doing is a lot different from what the US does with IMF loans. The IMF is like a front organization for the US. So a, a poor country wants a loan to build infrastructure. They would usually go to the IMF that would force them to enact neoliberal policies, to privatize their land, to, pri to do things that they didn't wanna do um, and the interests are high, high, they're high interest loans. Right. Um, the, the loans that China is, is giving these countries are low interest and they're with no strings attached. They don't have to reform their system. They don't have to privatize their industries. They don't have to do all. So I understand that there are gonna be different big brothers, but, and I am not here to defend everything about China, but their foreign yeah. policy is a much more humane than the U.S. foreign policy. <clears throat> I, I will say this about China. And, and I mean, if you want to believe what China has to say, China recently said that they had nothing to do with the coronavirus. I mean, I, I don't believe anything that comes out of China. China is very well focused on, on their goal. And they have a goal right. of, of uh, conquering the world. I mean, that, that's their goal. They want everything to be controlled by China and China to be the headquarters for the most part. And, and they do it in, in various ways. How many governments have they overthrown? That we know of? I don't know. How many dictators have they installed? That we know of? I mean, Nicaragua, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I just, I, when I would start and, saying and things like either. that, when they start doing like a fraction of what the U.S. has done, you know, oh, no, and I, I, I was just the, focusing the on Latin America, but the Middle East. Right. No. But here's the biggest difference between America and China. I think America is a lot more open. I mean, granted, there's a lot of things that that especially right now that's going on. That big brother in our own country is doing what they're supposed to, what they're not supposed to be doing. But I do believe, uh, you know, education. I mean, as far as how we're uh, educating our kids, that information comes out freely, whereas I would question that information coming out from China. So what I'm saying mm -hmm. is, you know, you, you, you're basing a lot of what you say on the fact that you believe what they put out. I don't believe anything they put out. I don't think they've proven mm -hmm. to put out anything that's that's worth believing. And and that's that's where I'm at. But you know what? That, that we I, I actually enjoy talking with you. This Same is here. Uh, this is this is totally off target target from uh, what, what the original topic is. And I, and I kind of want to stay on topic because I know that's what everybody's yeah. here for and that's what I'm talking about. Sure. Uh, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back off of here. I'm going to let, uh, let somebody else come on here, hopefully. Uh, yeah, someone jump on. Well, and Listen, I appreciate the fact that you were able to let me speak my piece. Thank you for that. I appreciate the fact that it was very candid. We were able to I have some, some serious dialogue here. Yeah. No, thank you for the thank dialogue you. we had. Thank you. I thank you. Same that. here. So, uh, all right. I'm going to say thank you. I'm going to add you as a friend, and hopefully we can do this again soon. It sounds good. Sounds good. All Bye, right. Brother. Thank you. Take I'll care. add you too later on. Okay. You take Bye, care brother. also. All right. Bye. All right. Jump on in if you want to jump in. We'll debate. We'll have a respectful debate. Schedule communism. Yes, communism. Why don't you answer the comments? I'm sorry I was speaking with this guy. I, I, I have ADHD and I have a hard time going back and forth, back and forth. But if you want to talk, if you're in, at home, you know, jump in as a guest and, and talk to me. I will teach you about socialism so you don't have to read Marx. You don't have to read. Send guest requests. Yeah, guys. Send, them, send me a guest request. <clears throat> Dave Chappelle. Yeah, and I'm really trying to not talk about, uh, like, Dave Chappelle, this current, you know, this, uh, what 
it is on the news cycle for the day. I don't want to talk about that bullshit. Um, I want to talk about these greater ideas of how we're going to improve our society. Do you know what communism is? Yeah, I do. Communism is... Tell me what communism is. A lot of people don't know what that actually is. There should be workplace democracy. Yeah, um, I believe in workplace democracy. And the debate that we should be having is how do we get to that point of workplace democracy? So there's not just a debate, you know, because I know like communists are looked at as this big like group, this mass of anti-Americans um, and crazy people, how could you believe in such a crazy thing? But there's actually a debate having within our ideology, which is how do we bring this about and how do we create uh, a socialism or communism that is most free, most empowering? And uh, that's what we're talking about. And anarchists are in that debate as well. Um, it's very rare to find someone who knows what anarchism actually is when the term anarchy in our vernacular is chaos, which it is not, doesn't even work in a small family unit. Um, communism works, uh, you know, it's funny. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen my, my actual TikToks. I talk a lot about, <clears throat> a lot about Palestine. And when this person said it doesn't work in a family unit, uh, I'm very pro-Palestine, but I work with an Israeli guy. And I was working with him, and he said, you know, you know how I know communism works? And I said, how? Because <laughs> I don't go around, I don't talk about this at work. I try to keep this separate. Um, he said, I, my parents grew up in a kibbutz in Israel, which are these giant Israeli communes. He's, my parents grew up in a kibbutz, and uh, I lived in it when I was little, and it was such a beautiful experience living in communism uh, in this kibbutz. And it showed me that in a, a small scale of that size, it can definitely work. Pro-Palestinian, Republican, that's awesome. If you're pro-Palestine, liberal, conservative, leftist, I, I just think that um, we need to advocate for these people in Palestine. You know, a lot of people don't know, but there are thousands of Palestinian Christians that are under the same oppression as the Palestinian Muslims. Um, if you are anything but an Israeli, an Israeli Jew, you are living under what is worse than apartheid. Um, I think the problem with communism is easily corruptible. I wouldn't say it's easily corruptible, but any society is corruptible. The, the difference between socialism and capitalism and that socialism is corruptible, but capitalism is based on that corruption. That's what it's founded on, and it it rewards corruption and the consolidation of power and wealth of just a few people. So, of course, like a socialist society is corruptible, but it's not based on that corruption. And that if our society rewards other things and we can hopefully work on that corruption and also um, hopefully this society wouldn't be under um, under imperialism and under attack under economic warfare the way these socialist countries have been it's you know people say socialism doesn't work but show me a socialist society that hasn't been under decades of economic literal warfare, hasn't been invaded, um, hasn't had coups, hasn't had rigged elections. Um, show me a socialist society that hasn't done that, that's just been able to fail on its own, and then I'd say, yeah, it failed. Um, but we really haven't been able to see that. Follow the host. Cool, cool. Thank you, guys. Vouch? Uh, are you talking about Vosh? I'm not a fan of Vosh. Um, he's great with debating di different like libertarians and fascists, but Vosh is an imperialist. Vosh is basically a liberal that calls himself a socialist. And the U.S. funds them, keep the capitalistic machine working. I know. Vosh, like, yeah, I don't like Vosh, but I have to say, like, he debated Charlie Kirk a couple of months ago, and he 
fucking did amazing against Charlie Kirk. And I got to give Vosh props, like, for debating Charlie Kirk. Like, how many of these little fashy boys and libertarians follow Charlie Kirk? And what I liked about Vosh's debate with Charlie Kirk was they both were able to, like, stay respectful and debate their ideas, um, which was really cool. And Charlie Kirk got totally owned in that debate. Pouch with a V, yeah. Um, but when you see Vosh debating a leftist, he's disgusting. Like, I saw on YouTube, he debated for two hours, this, this socialist, and for the first 30 minutes, Vosh is defending landlords. For 30 minutes debating landlords. It was horrendous. All right, bye. Um, yeah, so a socialist debating landlords is, like, totally terrible. Um, so that's where his true colors come out. Venezuela was corrupted because of American involvement. Yeah, 160 sanctions on Venezuela. Um, in Venezuela, before sanctions, their, their literacy, their quality of life was really increasing. Um, but then they went under sanctions. They've had a couple coup attempts. Um, two years ago, they were invaded by mercenaries that were tied to Colombia and the U.S. So, um, so yeah, they're under a lot of pressure. I'd like to see what happens in Venezuela if they did not, you know, if they were not under economic warfare. Collapse of oil prices as well. You know, it's funny, when I went to Cuba, I spoke with Cubans about the problems in Venezuela. Uh, and the U.S. and Saudi uh, government... Um, coerced together to drop oil prices to sabotage Venezuela. And when I speak with Americans, it's they don't really understand that. And when I spoke with Cubans in Cuba, they knew about that immediately. They knew about how the U.S. sabotaged and dropped oil prices um, to also uh, destroy the Venezuelan economy. Uh, what do you say to the people from Cuba and risk their life to escape and vote conservative? Um, Hey, Vanilla Skillet, uh, if, you're, if you want to talk, we can talk. If you want to send a guest request or I'll answer you. There's not a lot of people leaving right now. Um, most of the people that left happened after the revolution in 59. Uh, they also left in like 91. Um, but there are not droves of people leaving Cuba at this time. I went there a couple of years ago. Um, <clears throat> Cuba in 2019 ratified a new constitution that was written by the people, for the people. Um, and they're struggling a lot. Under COVID, when Cuba was sending doctors around the world to countries that were asking for them, the U.S. put more sanctions on Cuba. Uh, it's a very difficult situation. Um, I think that if they want to leave, I, I'm not going to judge them for leaving. It's a horrible situation. But now... A lot of the people are leaving are not like the Miami Cubans, not like the people in 91 and 59. A lot of them are leaving are socialists. Like I know some American socialist Cubans. Um, the United States is just turning up the pressure more and more and more. Kulinski gets way too emotional. Yeah, Kulinski is just a sock dem, man. I mean... And that's cool. Like, we can advocate for reforms within the system, but we need to advocate for a better system. Because if we just talk about these reforms, they'll be undone. How many times has the United States made progress and then that progress was undone? Completely mismanaged their economy. Sanctions didn't help, but not... Yeah, but we can say they mismanaged, but they mismanaged due to sanctions. We don't know what it's like to be under 160 economic sanctions a couple of years ago. I don't know if you heard about the Caracas blackouts, but that was tied back to the U.S. causing blackouts in Caracas. Um, so, oh, I got kids coming. Hey, guys. I'm going to move up. Hola, como esta? I got some family coming by. Um, so I'm not going to judge a country based on their reaction to economic warfare. 
I don't think it's fair. Um, hey guys. Does he own a business? <clears throat> so, uh, doesn't, communism doesn't work because it goes against human nature. Uh, no, I think that capitalism goes against human nature. It goes against nature, period, because no other creature hoards resources the way people do under capitalism. Uh, under capitalism, you know, do you ever see, like, a, a squirrel hoarding all of the acorns? Um, do you ever see, you know, they take whatever they need and the rest can, can, can survive? Um, and, uh, you know, <clears throat> under capitalism, there are people that hoard all the wealth and resources while the rest of us fight over the, the rest and uh, that is not na na natural. Tiffany, oh. Hello, Tiffany. I can't hear you. I don't think it's me. Let me turn this off for a second. Can you hear me, Tiffany? Hello? Oh. Go live together has ended, okay. Sorry that didn't work. I uh, agree that hoarding is bad, but it's natural. Ultimately, no, I, I, what I think is more natural is for people to have what they need to survive. Um, I think what's natural is people to find work that they find fulfilling. Uh, I think it's natural for people to have shelter and food and to have a more democratic system than what we have here. Um, and that's what socialism is about. Not had since I've spent two years in this pandemic. You guys are having a whole debate. But that's not the way humans' brain work. I don't teach my kids to steal or lie, but it's ingrained in them. I think a lot of things are ingrained in them. Uh, you know, I've read a lot of Ayn Rand and Milton Friedman, and they talk about human nature and that selfishness, you know, capitalism is based on selfishness, and they speak about it in a positive way, that capitalism is the right system because humans are selfish. But what they don't understand is that that is our, like, most basic, human part of our nature and that there's so much more to humanity than that. And I wouldn't even call it selfishness. I would call it our, our desire for self-preservation, that humans have a desire for self-preservation, not selfishness. And that if you want to have the best chance at self-preservation, then we are going to work, have to work collectively to create a type of society where we all have enough resources and food and shelter uh, to survive. Um, that's the best way, if, if we want to think about it in this type of terms of Ayn Rand, where self-preservation is the priority. Um, okay. Hey, Silverman, 55. <clears throat> um, a society, my, oh my God. My sense, I'm not talking about the vaccine, guys. Uh, I, I was speaking about this earlier. That you go through these fucking lives and you hear people arguing about the vaccines. Vaccines, vaccines, vaccines. Uh, it's crazy. Um, 
I'm going to try to stay away from vaccines and I want to talk about like life, economics, how, how we can, you know, uh, if you defend capitalism, why? Um, let me try to don't care about your feelings. Uh, I'm not a liberal. Hey, Windex, I'm not a liberal. I'm a communist. Um, there is a difference and facts definitely don't care about people's feelings. There is some in between capitalism with unions, healthcare and stuff. You probably are a liberal f fruitcake. <laughs> no, I'm not a liberal. I definitely abandoned liberalism. I abandoned the ideas of liberal reforms, of the idea that like corporate power and Wall Street can be reformed to benefit all. I don't believe in private property, which liberals and conservatives have in common. I'm a leftist. Um, there, there is a difference, but I know in the United States, what we have is the Overton window, and it's really like, it's left and, it, the left and right is liberal and conservative. And you're either liberal or you're conservative, and there's nothing really outside of those two ideologies, which have more in common than most people would think. And I, I believe that they, they, the media and the education system and our culture keeps it that way. So we don't try to strive for a better way. My stance on abortion, um, <clears throat> I'll talk about it briefly, but I'd really love to see less abortions in our society. Uh, I think uh, an abortion is a very sad thing. I understand the idea that if you get an abortion after a certain point, there is a heartbeat and has a genetic code and all that stuff. Um, I think uh, the best way to end abortions is to give more services to these mothers so they could, they could want to have this child. Um, I think a lot of people don't, they have abortions because they know that they don't have the resources to bring this child in, into, into existence. They don't have the resources. They, I mean, childcare is extremely expensive. Life is extremely expensive and it's getting more expensive. And if they knew that they would be supported, then I think there would be much less abortions. And I think everyone would be happy but the problem is that the party and the ideology, conservatism, that is pro-life also is seeking to end and diminish all these services for these young moms. Social Security bankrupt. No, it didn't bankrupt America. Um, Social Security did not bankrupt America. Any federal programs do not bankrupt America because America runs on a fiat currency. And our taxes that go to the federal government do not fund federal spending. And it's been that way since 1971, when the United States left the gold standard and went to a fiat currency. So we do not need to worry about as long as we, you know, raise the debt ceiling or whatever, funding federal programs. Um, there's a blank check for the military. There's a blank check for subsidies for oil companies. There's a blank check for, hey, guest request. Oh, a conservative. I didn't want to talk to a conservative, but okay. Let's give it a shot. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hey. I'm Chris. Hey, I'm Arlie. Hey, Arlie. Marley, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um... Hold on. Someone just said, I don't trust any Republican or conservatives. Okay. So I'm really moderate. I'm a very moderate conservative. I'm not like, you know, I'm not a Bible thumper. And I like when women can choose, you know, their rights. But right. when it comes to abortion, um, at the end of the day, you're after the, it's a beating heart. You know, there's, there's brain there. Like it's, it's right. a baby. And, and people want to say, well, you know, she didn't have a choice. Um, well, when people know how you make babies, you have to, you know, have sex to have a baby. Um, with yeah. Along with getting an abortion, the same place mm -hmm. you can get abortion, you can get free birth control. Yeah. 
Um, concerned. Oh, let's see. I I don't understand how people can sit here and just be like, oh, you know, um, I didn't have another option. Um, there's plenty of places to get birth. Sorry, I have I have two kids, three kids. Um, and there's places you can get abortion. There are also places you can get free birth control. Mm-hmm. I'm not I'm in some fix. places. In some places, it's very hard. It's very hard. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. And I I know in the Bible, someone just said, you know, the first the first breath. Yeah. If you actually look, you know, it up, mm-hmm. babies do breathe in amniotic fluid. They're they're breathing. They feel pain. It is, you know, studies have showed that babies in the womb can feel pain. They're it's not just a bunch of cells until people actually right. go and like, you know, look up what a baby is at 15 weeks, at 20 weeks. I don't think I don't think we should be killing, you know, anybody, especially right. the newborn babies. Like, I don't. <sighs> we got another guest request coming in. If you don't mind, we can try to have another person. But oh, yeah, what I can awesome. say to you is that, um, you know, I think, first of all, I, I only want to talk about abortion for like a minute. It's not really what I'm here for. I'm, I'm really here to talk about like economics and more bigger picture stuff. But what I want to say to you that I don't think you hear a lot from the left or from from liberals or from leftists is that I completely understand and agree with you. And I think that we should do everything we can to make women not seek abortions. And to do that, we should try to create a, a society where these women want to bring a child into the world where they know they're not going to be totally screwed because that's why they do it and no woman wants to bring no one wants to have an abortion it's awful you know i mean they're scared i don't know if you've ever asked a woman but there's guilt uh there's shame it's a lot of time it's a woman's deepest darkest secret that she did this so no one wants to do it and if you know i don't you have you looked at daycare centers um, it's so expensive, you know. And I, I have we, twins. I have twins. Whoa. They're two. Yes. Okay. Um, I just quit my job, and I'm now a stay-at-home mom because we make too much <clears throat> to get any kind of assistance. Just my boyfriend by himself makes too much for EBT, too much for WIC, and too much for daycare assistance. I was mm-hmm. paying twelve hundred. I was paying twelve hundred dollars a month where I live. For both my girls to go to daycare right and that was half of my check and me and my boyfriend yeah. decided you know what it's daycare is ridiculous i i feel like it's they need ridiculous. to do some expansion they need to do expansion on on daycare assistance especially if know, they actually yeah. want people to work yeah and also understand these daycare workers are like not wealthy people like as much as it is like they are in the lower end of the working class, like they're struggling. Um, it's just so expensive. And there's, there's a lot of regulation, rightfully so, um, in daycare, because we want our children to be in a good place. So, you know, during World War II, daycare was completely subsidized by the federal government. And most of Europe has that as well, that daycare is completely subsidized by the federal government. And also, if we had a more fair education system where poor neighborhoods have shitty education, rich neighborhoods have great education, I think people would say, listen, I'm I'm not going to get an abortion because I'm going to bring this child into the world. I'm going to get some help when the kid is young, and then the kid's going to go to great schools, and then I'm going to have someone to wipe my ass and change my diaper when I'm old. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. Wait, I I have a question, like... Why can't you guys like what's it called make like friends and half half of the week like you take care of their kids and your kids and the other half of the week like Mommy. take care of take care of your kids Mommy. and their kids and you guys go work part time because work schedules don't all honestly line up like that you can't not every job is gonna be like okay I'm only gonna let you work Monday Tuesday and Wednesday so you can take off Thursday Friday and Saturday and take care of someone else's kids part time jobs 
typically don't work that way. Or, which is the crappy part. Mommy? Yeah, I mean, that, that's very hard for parents to, to do something like that. And I don't think that's a solution across our country for people to like, hey, can we take care of each other's kids? Like, how? You know, I want my kid to be in a regulated, like, healthy, clean environment. So, anyway. Yeah. Um, thank you. I'm just trying to get this other guy. Hello? Uh, Black History? Hey. Hello. Oh, we got a baby. Hey, baby. So I'm I BX Pro, but I also go by the name Chris. Nice to meet you. Hello, Chris. Oh, that's her father's name. Ah. Oh, okay. Um, I also wanted to go on. I know you, the other person just asked the question of why you can't just have um, like one person work one week and the other person work another week. So her father and I are, well, I was in the military. I actually just got out yesterday. Um, oh, wow. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. But um, me and her live in New Jersey right now while her father's in North Carolina. And it is extremely hard for me to find another job and maintain daycare for her because daycare is only during the day. And yeah. a lot of jobs <clears throat> are requiring me, like want me to stay later than I can stay because and daycare doesn't run that long. Or a lot of jobs nowadays don't have set schedules. It's like, oh, this week right. you're working Thursday, Friday, and next week you're working whatever. So it's extremely, extremely difficult. Yeah. Yeah, it's super hard, and there are more services for the poor. And yes. there are, and the rich, uh, they could do whatever they want. So it's, it's us members of like the middle working class that, you know, daycare can be like 800 a month. Yeah, that's cause like even- a, that's, that's like a rent payment. Exactly. Even with me not being in the service anymore, I do get retirement and disability. I don't qualify for any government assistance or anything like that, which was crazy to me because I don't feel like I make that much. But apparently the government decided that I make too much, so I, I can't get any type of the food stamps or, or um, welfare or anything like that. So it's like, what am I supposed to do? It's hard. Wait, don't because... you get free housing in the military for like uh, married no, couples? You, you, you do not get free housing and me and her father are not married. So that's a misconception about the military. People think free, it's not free housing. You get it when you're in the service. Housing assistance. Yes, you get housing assistance. And that's only if you decide to live on post. And as of currently, most military bases are at capacity, meaning that you can't find on post housing. So what they give you is a rough estimate of what the cost of living in your area is. And nine times out of 10, you're staying somewhere that you don't want to stay if you want to live within that budget. So then you're cutting into other funds, trying to basically live above your means so that you and your family are safe. Um, when we were in North Carolina, so example, the apartment that we were staying in was a two bedroom apartment. And we have two, like we have another daughter mm -hmm. and um, we were only getting nineteen hundred dollars a month, not nineteen hundred dollars. That's what I get up here in New Jersey. Down there, we were only getting $1,200 a month, and that was a little shy of what our rent was for a two-bedroom, mm -hmm. but our two-bedroom was not in the greatest neighborhood. Um, like, we had to get, like, all the extra security stuff put into place right. in, our, in our place because it's just not necessarily the safest. We were, I don't know how much you know about certain areas, but we were in Fayetteville, North Carolina, which has a... Mama, mama has a joke called Vietnam because of how mm. intense it can get there. But yeah, you know, it's funny. I was I was speaking with someone a while back on this live about the military and about why people join the military. Um, and a lot of people join the military these days because there's not too many more options. Um, you know, a lot of them don't want to, but it's the only way to make a career, to have health care. Um, there you are. <clears throat> Sorry, yeah, I was, that's okay. Oh, that's funny. I was talking to someone earlier on this live about the, a lot of the reasons people join the military. 
And for a lot of people, the last reason they joined the military is that they want to fight in war. Um, yeah, or they the want to do anything last... like that. They join because they want health care, they want housing assistance, they want to get assistance with education, mm -hmm. and they're hoping to not, you know, uh, not do anything like or anything close to going overseas and fighting. And a lot of people that join the military really are critical of the past wars that the U.S. military has fought in. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, when I speak with with veterans, they're like the Iraq war that was messed up um, and they hope that they don't have to do that and just get in, get out, get the benefits and hopefully do something positive for society in the meantime, because I yes. know it's not all bad. Um, but yeah, it's hard. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I I was looking for a sense of structure <clears throat> and a yeah, structure in my life when I joined. Um, I was definitely looking for the help with going to school um, and just bettering myself. Um, I will say, sadly, with I had to get out medically. And the military does. It's kind of like, oh, well, we used you up to the best of our abilities. And now you're forced mm -hmm. to get out type thing. Um, I don't regret it at all. I met amazing people and all of that. But it's definitely... Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I definitely agree. A lot of us, it's, it is, it, it was a, I'm not saying it was a pointless war, the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan, the war in the Middle East in general. It's not that it's pointless. It's just gone on for far too long. And right, I definitely right. believe um, it's run its course yeah. as far as what we were capable of. When I, I was deployed, um, when we were out there, I spent the majority of my time, um, helping the Afghan, uh, soldiers learning different tactics and things like that and it is it shouldn't take 10 15 plus years to learn what Correct. we our soldiers sure. in a matter of three months for basic training so mm -hmm. so for me i'm i'm 39 i was 19 years old when 9 11 happened mm -hmm. and the u.s quickly went to afghanistan went to iraq and the world changed and a lot of people were going to war and I was getting calls from recruiters weekly. Yeah. And I, I was really withholding my opinion because it's just kind of the person that I am. I, I don't form opinions quickly. I really want to learn all sides of it before I say I support something, I oppose something. And the more that was uncovered about Iraq, especially, the more I was like, oh, my God. Like, it really changed my views um, a lot. I stopped. I was a Republican until I was 22. Mm -hmm. um, and I really became a big anti-war advocate um, after that. And I still, you know, just learn more and more. I'm, I'm half Latino. I don't know where you're from. But learning the history of U.S. foreign policy in Latin America just really was really scary. Um, I ended up getting a job for my city. I live in New York City. But it's like whether you join the military or get a job for your city, a municipal job, like what are the options for people now? You yeah. know, people are, what other, like join, go to work at, at retail, work in a restaurant, work right. at an Amazon center. Like if you want to build, you know, build a career, have a home, have healthcare, have all those things, it's it, your, your options are getting more and more limited. And that's why... I'm here to talk about socialism uh, because uh, a lot of people don't know what it is and they're afraid of it. They oppose it. They hate it. But um, it's nothing to be scared of. But see, and I also think because you said that, you know, when you were younger, you you considered yourself <clears throat> Republican. I battle so much with the Republican and Democrat thought process because <clears throat> If you go back to the core ideals, I am, I do think I'm a Republican with core okay. ideals, but what the Republican Party stands for today, I don't agree with, which is, it's, right. it's just odd to me, the shift in, in beliefs and, and values. And I don't like okay. the whole, I don't like the umbrella thought process that, well, if you're a Republican or if you're Democratic, you have to agree with everything that the party stands for. Because I agree. I, I definitely have views on both sides of the fence where I'm like, okay, that makes sense. And then I'm like, okay, well, no, that makes sense too, though. So I, 
I do wish that we as a country could get past that and just yeah. you know realize that you can like like my thought process is that it doesn't matter which aisle what side of the aisle you're on the betterment of the country should be why you decided to run for all public office in general so whatever you right. think is best for the country should be where your mind frame is it doesn't matter if if the person who's presenting an idea that you agree with is democrat and you're republican you should be like oh i like that i'm going to support that sure I mean, what I have to say about that is that both parties are more similar than they're different, especially mm -hmm. in terms of economics. Oh yeah. Um, they differ. They differ a lot on like cultural issues, um, a lot, you know. Um, but in terms of economics, they both support like a free market, pretty much deregulated capitalism. They both mm -hmm. um, really even get money from the same like wealthy donors. So a donor will give money to both. Republicans and Democrats, and then want a return on that investment uh, once that person is elected. And I think that is really the reason that we don't move forward is because the, 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 these politicians are really controlled by these corporate interests, and that they listen to the corporate interests more than they listen to us. And even the Democrats speak empty promises. Yes. To, they speak empty promises to people of color or different minority groups but they don't do shit, you know? And conservatives, uh, Republicans, I think they're a little bit more honest in their loyalty to wealth and greed, in, in my opinion. Um, I, I do agree with that. And it's, it's almost like, do you want somebody who's gonna tell you that they're screwing you over or do you want somebody that screw you over but you just don't know about it yet like it's like <clears throat> I want neither yeah I want neither and my goal here is to try to ask people to think outside of the box mm -hmm. and and to try to you know continue building a movement that wants something outside of these two parties that have very little difference, but are fighting so much. Um, and that doesn't mean, that, mean, that means not supporting Republicans or, and Democrats. Wait, um, that doesn't mean not voting. Yeah. Yeah, so is it possible, like, if you think about it, like, we have, like, each state has, like, a leadership, like, where somebody that represents, like, the people for, like, the lifetime. But, like, what's it called? It's represent, not by, like, it's not, like, controlled by, like, the rich, but it stands out for the poor. Like you somebody mean, on top, like that doesn't like um, get voted out every four years, like senators and Democrats, like those type well, of people. That, I feel like that would be more like either a dictatorship or a monarchy. You mean like someone who's not? Yeah, it's similar, but what's it called? It's better than having somebody that stays in office for four years and then just leaves without taking accountability for the actions because they're not in power anymore. Okay. Are you talking about in each individual state, someone who does not have term limits? Yeah. So someone who, who kind of represents the people, but he could get voted out if he's not, like, doing his job correctly. A mix between, like, a lot of systems. I mean, I can get that because I get what you're saying as far as, like, long-term, like, because we do. We constantly see as soon as a new president comes, people automatically jump to, okay, this is why this is happening because of this new president. Uh, uh, uh. Let me just say my stance on that, at least under a capitalist system, is that politicians are like diapers. We they must be changed. They must be changed often. Um, you know, I I do not believe in. I think people should come in. They should be public servants. These people should run for office. They should be teachers. They should be firefighters. They should be regular people, and they should not have to raise millions of dollars in order to achieve office. And, and they should represent us. Um, I don't, I, and then they should get the hell out, um, even the but, good ones. <clears throat> but what's it called? Uh, so I come from Pakistan, so we had a, like, a previous president. His name was Nawaz Sharif. So this motherfucker, yeah. like, <laughs> generally speaking, he stole from like, the people for like 15 years, like under a, somewhat yeah. of a dem democracy country. Right. And just fucking it's left. A, like when he got caught, he just left to yeah. like UK and stuff. 
and they can't prosecute him since he's in like a different country. That's why I kind of don't yeah. support like democracy. Well, you know, Plato said democracy is a dangerous thing in the hands of an uneducated population. And that's what we have here in America. <laughs> that's what we have here. We have an uneducated population. So I think that democracy would be better and we would be able to have more democracy if we educated people and we had a system where first of all, education ar across the board was the same. Whether you lived in a poor area, a rich area, everyone got the same education. Um, then we can make responsible decisions, but the lack of education is a tool they use. It's a tool they use to keep us supporting people that don't represent us. But what's it called? If you think about it in today's time, like you can't really like, even if you try, you can't as much like uh, influence regular, pe like, regular people because of like media, like, like uh, in the nineties, like, and you see the generations today, like, the shit they saw growing up, like they act like that now. The people, like the mm -hmm. shit, that, like the kids that are seeing the shit that's happening right now, they're gonna act like that in like 10, 20 years. So we don't really have that much control over like education, like even the regular people. You can't even educate your family that much. They all hold like different ideas from different TV shows and different like podcast uses they watch. So, yeah, I mean, how often do you hear people? you know, acting in a certain negative way or doing certain negative things. And they just say, that's the way I was raised. Oh, God. Um, yeah, and that, that type of mentality really is very normal. Um, and it's hard to break out of generational behaviors. Um, so, but people have to try and that's where hopefully education would come through. But yeah, that's super hard, super hard. And religion plays a part in it, too. I think that as far as education goes also, I, I do have something against the thought process that I, I feel like they sugarcoat education with children and thinking that they can't absorb as much as they really can. Mm -hmm. And then you society expect them to know certain things that they're not taught. Like... Mm -hmm basic fundamentals as far as like I'm sorry but I, especially with being in the military I had soldiers who were under me that were 17 18 just coming in fresh out of high school and didn't know how to do basic things like open a bank account like yeah and that's it's it's crazy I mean I had to grow up a little bit different because of how my family was we didn't grow are up you different. originally from New Jersey yes yeah so I I'm not saying I grew up fast paced but I, I was exposed to a lot more um especially it was just me and my mom growing up so she leaned on me a lot so i was i did have that sense of responsibility but there are there are children today that don't or there are adults today because they're not children they're adults that don't know how to take care of themselves basically right and, and i do blame that on the education system and thinking that oh no well we have to focus in on teaching them yeah <clears throat> And I hate to say it because I don't want to speak negatively of people from down south, but it's not their fault. But I've had a lot of friends from down south and I talked to them about some historical event and, and never heard of it. Hmm. They don't know it. And I'm like, we learned this in high school. And they were like, we didn't learn that. Hmm. And uh, it's a big problem. You know? It, 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 and it's kind of crazy to me that a lot of people in the South don't even know their own history. Like, yeah, we're rich in history in the Northeast, but there is a lot of history in the South. And it's not even that sure. they don't know it. They know it wrong. It's mm -hmm. like... Sometimes, yeah. A lot of them believe certain things. And I'm like, wait, no, no, that's not true. Yeah. And we have adopted this, like, don't get me wrong. I love the internet. I love social media and platforms let people get their voices heard on certain things but we don't live in a society of people who understand how to really research something so as soon as somebody sees a Facebook, right. oh this is fact i have to repost it <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, I, and it gets spread to the masses and it's just like oh my god and it's like oh do well, your I research yeah, yeah do your research is this term that people started using and they don't even like i've gone to college i've done research 
that's research. Research is not like Googling a couple of things. Yeah, and I've had people who didn't even realize that there were actual scholar search engines. Like, I was, they yeah. were like, oh, I Googled it. And I'm like, okay, well, did you use any other search engines? Did you actually look at journals or, or different? Like, I'm like, dude, there are so many other outlets that are more credible. Mm-hmm. And they, like, everybody's like, oh, well, I just looked on Google and I looked at the top three. This is the top. Yeah, answer. that's not good. That's not good. Yeah. And when, oh. and when we look at things, we have to look at it critically, you know, where, okay, I'm leaning towards this idea. I think I agree with that idea, but let me look for the fault in that idea now. Oh, yes. You know what I mean? Let me look for yeah. the fault in that idea before I completely like buy into the, to, into that idea, you know, and um, that comes with a better education system, you know. Wait, what's your opinion on religion? Everybody keeps talking about religion in chat. What aspect? Like in general, like the overview. Um, I mean, I'm not a super duper religious person. It's one of those, I think that that's, it's like almost like a, like to me, my relationship with a higher power is almost like my relationship with say my. Yeah. Those, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I would say it's similar I, to you. Yeah, and I respect anybody else's relationship. Sure. Like, if you decide you want to, you know, do whatever, I'm like, okay, cool, as long as you're not hurting nobody. Yeah, but you know, my, 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 I'll just say real quick. I believe I was raised uh, in a very Catholic family, um, but I believe that religion, for the most part, has been used as a tool to control people. Uh, especially the three Abrahamic religions. I'm critical of all three of them. Uh, I think there's a lot of contradiction. Uh, If you want to practice your religion, I think that's cool. But I'm critical of the power and influence that these religions have had over people. For me, I'm Muslim, but what's it called? Like even studying, like I try to study all different religions, but what I've noticed is even in like the Christian, Judaism and Islam, like uh, there's different like sects that just like try to get more influence over people. Very true. But there's, but like well, what's it called? There in Islam, there's like only one sect, like not a sect, but like a group of people that don't like really fall into that category. But like I've tried to look for those people in different like Christianity and Judaism. They're very rare to find though. Okay. What do you mean? Like people that are actually like good, like. Uh, Someone that, that pretends to be good, but there's like, you, like even if you had like a friend, like you could test it, like they'll help you out certain times, but they won't help you out like in other times, like when you're really sure. in desperate in need. But like in Islam, yeah. it's diff- a little bit different because like you might find those people that are, will be there for you like all the time, which is rare, but it's still there. Yeah, I mean, I, I've grown up with a lot of Muslim people around where I live and they're very good to their neighbors. That's one part of their religion is that neighbors are like family. Um, so there's definitely good things in that religion. Um, there's good things in Christianity and Judaism as well. But there's also enough things in all three of them that for me, I choose to not practice them. Yeah, that, that is uh, true. With like, <clears throat> there's certain things in Islam that are just like made up by people afterwards, like yeah. in like uh, after like 800, 800 years to like a thousand years like eight eight like eight, 88 like yeah people made that shit up for like personal gains and shit like and yeah. the next generation they kept using that for a while but there's a lot of things that i don't believe in even in islam like i don't deny the mm-hmm. book but i like there's in islam there's a lot of shit like people just corrupted like created by them like tongues like over like time Hey guys, my phone is about to die, so I'm going to need to jump off of this. But it was really nice speaking with you all. I have a good one. Okay. Have a good one, guys.